Are we ready? <laughs> Danielle, ready to go? Ready. Okay. So delighted to see everybody. So good to see all of your faces here today. Yes, we're going to be starting in a minute or two, just waiting for people to log on. Just really excited to see all of you here today. And you are here from all over the world, mm -hmm. which is very exciting to us. And I'm seeing faces I've never seen before. And that's exciting too. I feel so warm and my heart is so full seeing so many of you today. I'm just looking through and seeing everyone who's here. Some folks are newer and some folks have been with us for a while. Yes, I'm very excited to see everyone. If you have never joined us at one of these meetings before and you require translations, you can go to the bottom of your screen and there should be an icon for interpretation. And when you click on that icon, you will have the option to watch this in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. Once again, I wanna welcome everyone to our webinar, a revolutionary approach to transforming the worldwide loneliness and isolation epidemic. I'm Mavis Tsai, I'm the founder of Awareness, Courage and Love Global Project. And I'm invested in this project from both a personal and a professional perspective. So personally, I experienced a great deal of social exclusion and isolation as I was growing up, which is just part of my being. And I took that experience into my professional life and co-created with my late spouse, Robert Kohlenberg, Functional Analytic Psychotherapy, which focuses on authentic connections between therapists and clients. And I'll be talking about that more a little bit later. And then we just thought this was such a great way to bring authentic connection to everyone who wants it. And I'm so delighted to be co-leading this webinar with Danielle Newcomb. You want to introduce yourself, Danielle? Yeah, um, my name is Danielle Newcomb, and I am the manager of community building and education for Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project. This is also something that is important to me both personally and professionally from a personal standpoint. I, I have always felt like I am the odd one out, and so that's something that I personally carry with me. And then from a professional standpoint, before this, I did work with a lot of multiply marginalized communities, including youth experiencing homelessness. And professionally, I saw a lot of them thrive while they were able to access resources in the community. And then when they got housed and they were no longer eligible for those services, I saw them struggle often ending back up in homelessness. So I left that area to look for something and somewhere where community and connection was the first priority. And we're so grateful to have you on our team. So the Awareness, Courage and Love Global Project has scientifically backed outcomes. And what we do is we create space for people all over the world to come together, to connect, to belong, to heal, and to express their truest selves. As we all know, human beings are wired for connection. And it's almost as essential to our survival, to our long-term survival as food and water. Social connection is a critical contributor to our health by reducing stress, anxiety, depression, and providing support for everyone during difficult times. It contributes to community safety because communities with strong social ties are just safer when we all look out for one another. It enhances resilience because uh, uh, we're uh. helping individuals and communities recover from hardships and disasters. And 
prosperity. Social connection fosters prosperity by promoting trust, collaboration, and economic opportunities within a community. So briefly, I'm gonna go into a little bit more about how social connection influences our health. We're gonna be referencing the US Surgeon General's 2023 report on loneliness and isolation uh, quite a bit, but much of this can be extrapolated to apply to the worldwide situation. So social connection affects our health on a biological level by reducing stress hormones and inflammation while promoting the release of bonding hormones like oxytocin, which leads to improved immune function. It affects our psychology, our psychological well-being by providing emotional support, fostering positive attitudes, improving cognitive function and memory and behaviorally social connection influences our health through peer influence, accountability, encouragement to adopt healthier habits. And Daniil's gonna be going into this a bit more. When we talk about healthier habits and what social connection can do to benefit us, there's two ways that happens. It's both as an individual and as a community. Um, and when we're a part of socially connected communities, we experience things like better population health, which means that the general health of our entire community is increased. Um, we experience things like resilience in the face of disasters uh, and feeling more prepared to handle those disasters. Uh, our economy is much more prosperous and the levels of violence that happen in our communities greatly decrease. And then if you think about it from an individual perspective, you end up having some amazing things which are reduced risk to premature mortality or um, dying younger. And you have greater achievement in both school and in your workforce or your economy. And it becomes a really good prediction for higher, more positive levels of mental and physical health. And then one of my favorites is socially connected individuals experience lower levels of stress than those who are not socially connected. In our experiential meetings, we always have a meditation to bring people into the present moment and to connect more with whatever it is that we're talking about. So today I'm going to invite you to join me in a very brief meditation on loneliness and belonging, just to bring your hearts into our presentation. So if you could settle comfortably into your chair and focus on your breath, on your inhale and exhale, finding a rhythm that allows you to tune into yourself. If you can, try to tune into the present moment with curiosity, with fresh eyes, and feel the wonder and awe the tug and the ache of being alive. When you focus on the feeling of belonging, what arises for you?
Is the feeling of belonging something that you take for granted? Or is the feeling of belonging mostly missing in your life? Can you let your heart open to whatever is coming up for you regarding the feeling of belonging, whether it's memories, images, sensations, whether they're positive or negative. And just be with your experience with kindness, curiosity, and non-judgment. Most of us have a need to connect with others who deeply understand and validate our struggles. Some of us hold secrets that feel too vulnerable to share with others. Belonging starts with allowing in an essence of your psyche that wants reunion with you so that you can feel more whole. See if you can complete this stem sentence with some vulnerable truths that are just for your years. You won't have to share this with anyone else. I am. Let's complete that sentence for yourself. I am. Let your mind and heart free associate some answers that are longing to be heard. I am. One final one. I am. What if you let these parts of you return home to be held to be known, to be allowed back into the vastness of who you are, keeping in mind that when you feel more whole, you can create more belonging for yourself and others. Staying connected to your heart. Once again, feel the rise and fall of your breath. Feel the support of your chair. Very gradually, as you feel ready, slowly bring your attention back to this room. We welcome you to write and chat a few words about your experience from this meditation. Just looking at all of you and appreciating you and reading the beautiful, descriptions of feelings that you're writing in chat. Hmm. Thank you for being part of our meditation. A lot of really wonderful things are coming to me. <laughs> there, now people can chat with everyone. So for me, what this meditation brings up is two things. Um, one is this incredible sense of warmth, um, the feeling of home. And it also brings up something else, which is the concept of missing things and like missing close people who are near me or missing spaces that no longer exist. And so when we look at our next slide, I can somewhat feel like I relate to that. One in 
five people who responded to a study completed in 2018 said that they rarely or never felt close to people. And I feel like there's such a sadness in that, in that concept of not feeling connected or like you belong. Uh, and so if we think about how many people are here in this meeting, it's, it's nearly close to 70. And if one in five of those people feel that way, statistically speaking, there have to be people in this room who also feel this way. And just from a personal perspective, I want you to know that you aren't alone in that. And that's something that I have also felt at times in my life. And that I feel blessed to have the people that I do feel close to here in this meeting, in this webinar with us. I certainly feel the same way, Danielle. When we consider the loneliness epidemic, it's something that is so widespread that for in the US, it is more widespread than major health issues like heart disease and diabetes and substance abuse and mental health disorders and, and even some cancers. It's something that has been highly impactful here. And as Mavis said, while we've got a lot of statistics that are from the US, uh, we would also love to be able to present a more global perspective on this with research that is from other locations as well. When we think about it, loneliness doesn't just affect our bodies, it also affects our minds. So loneliness is associated with medical comorbidities that are covering multiple systems in our body. Um, it affects our immunological systems. It affects our mental health. It affects our ability to sleep. It affects our cardiovascular health and our neuroendocrine health as well. And when it affects all of those, it can be really impactful on our lives. In addition to that, uh, people who feel alone are 1.9 times as likely to experience suicidal ideation. And in the Van Orden report of 2010, they made the statement that social isolation is one of the strongest and most reliable predictors of suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, and lethal suicide behavior, which is pretty heavy, how it can affect all of the systems in our body and also affect our mind to the point of lethal suicide behaviors. Now, Danielle, I was just going to say that makes my heart feel so heavy. Yeah, mine too. And this is a study of hundreds of thousands of people. It's a meta-analysis combining, I think 140 studies that show that when people lack social connection, it predicts premature mortality as much as smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day and more so than drinking six alcoholic drinks, more so than physical inactivity, obesity and air pollution. It's something that is so detrimental to our health, being isolated. So this says loneliness is prospectively associated with depression across the lifespan. And Daniil, you want to explain what that means? Yeah. So when I read the heading of this slide that Mavis sent me, um, I immediately said, Mavis, I have no idea what that means. And for those of you that know me, I am not a therapist. I am a lay person, right? And so when I read that title, I immediately went to go search for what these words mean because I needed to know what we were talking about. And it turns out when something is prospectively associated, it means that 
it is almost like a predictor of the future. So if you're experiencing loneliness early on in your life, then at some point in the future of your life, you are highly likely to experience depression. They've found correlations between it and Mavis is gonna show several of the studies across the screen where they've found this. Studies go on, these are just a few of them. And when we think about the relationship between loneliness and depression, we also need to think about the impact that having a large percentage of the population experience depression can have on our society. Um, in 2010, Greenberg did a study that estimated that $210.5 billion were lost in the economy related to direct costs of the folks who are experiencing depression, needing care, needing to not be able to work, needing things like that, and then another 5% being related to suicide related costs and 50% of those costs being workplace costs. So when someone was unable to show up in their workplace the way that was needed or wanted. Um, and what makes this even more surprising is I went and I found an updated set of research from Greenberg and his team. And that research published in 2021 on a 2020 study, has seen that number increase dramatically here in the US. And so it went from 210.5 billion in 2010, all the way up to $326.2 billion in the year 2020. And these are pre-pandemic numbers. So I imagine yes. they're even higher now. So depression will be the leading cause of disability worldwide by 2030. And this is simply a slide showing a combination of studies that indicate loneliness is increasing over time from 1976 to 2019, which is slightly going up every year. So I know when I experience a very heavy feeling in my heart, my mind starts to try and think of the solution. Surely there must be a solution. Surely we can't have all of this cost, all of the depression, all of the loneliness impacting people's health, their emotional well-being, their mental well-being, their physical well-being. Surely there has to be something. And when we look specifically at the U.S., we find that there actually is a lacking where support is needed. So six of 10 psychologists in the U.S. don't have any openings for new patients. They simply cannot support any more patients in their practice. And when we look beyond that to the people who are in need, 150 million people live in what is called a federally designated mental health professional shortage area. That means they have um, a very small number of mental health professionals in the area surrounding where they live. And then more to that point, over half of the counties in the United States don't even have a psychiatrist within them to be able to treat and prescribe folks who are struggling with their mental health. And so it looks pretty, pretty dire 
And folks have started thinking about what about group therapy? How can we cover this in groups? And that looks a little better. Like we need 10% of that need that I just talked about with a group therapy session instead of an individual session, then we're going to reduce our need for new therapists by nearly 40,000. We're going to save the U.S. $5.6 billion. And we're going to be able to serve 3.5 million more people. Now, I don't know how many of you are thinking back to the slides and the information you just got, but for context, that cost of depression alone on our economy in the U.S. was $326.2 billion in 2020, which is 1.7% that we would be decreasing the amount of money if we went to group therapy for 10% of our population. and. Those 3.5 million people who would be served in group therapy is only about 2% of the population that exists in areas that have a shortage of mental health providers. So a solution like group therapy is not something that's going to get at the large and vast problem that we're experiencing and that's when I start to think, what if there's a therapeutic option that exists without needing a therapist, what can we do there? And layperson-led groups, groups led by folks like me, right? I'm not a therapist. Layperson-led groups have been super effective for treatment of substance abuse disorders and schizophrenia. And so if we take the lessons that were learned about the effectiveness in those areas, I have to wonder, what about loneliness? What can be done for loneliness? Which Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project thinks that we can do that. We think that with shared experiences that are created and reviewed by therapists and based on scientifically supported research, we can have everyday people lead these groups to help people feel a little less lonely in communities around the world. And Mavis, I'm hoping that you will tell us some of the beautiful history of Redis. So the background of the Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project stems from functional analytic psychotherapy or FAP, which is I was saying at the beginning of the webinar, my late spouse, Robert Kohlenberg, and I co-created this therapy that focuses on the here and now connection between therapist and client as this powerful mechanism of change. So the, the perspective is that many problematic behaviors occur in interpersonal contexts and that behavior is influenced much more effectively with natural and authentic consequences by like that, just what happens after behavior, the response. If it's immediate in time and close in space, that happens right afterwards. And in fact, we pay attention to behaviors that are occurring in therapy rather than outside the session. And it leads to a treatment that's just more fascinating and intense and impactful. These are the five rules of FAP. I'm not going to go into them in very much detail, many of what they're about. And they're simple, but they take a lifetime to really master. And I'm still getting better at this. So rule one is noticing the clinically relevant behaviors, which affect the client's daily life and just seeing how they bring their behaviors right into the moment. It involves awareness. So rather than talking about their problems, getting close to people in their daily lives, we look at how do their intimacy problems or behaviors, or their behaviors blocking connection? How do they show up right in the session with me as the therapist? Rule two is evoking 
these clinically relevant behaviors, just intentionally and authentically being myself and seeing how I can bring out both their avoidance behaviors and what we want to improve just right in the session. And that often takes courage on the part of the therapist. Rule three is providing both positive and negative consequences that are natural and authentic in the session. And this is another way of saying being loving. Rule four is noticing our impact and whether we're actually helping our clients change the way that they want to. Rule five is making sure that they generalize whatever improvements they're making in therapy to, the daily, to their daily lives. And so that requires awareness, courage, and love. But this is where the terms awareness, courage, and love come from. It's from the five rules of FAP. And because there was such a bottleneck in terms of both therapists who wanted to be trained in FAP and people in the general public who wanted to experience this kind of therapy, I thought, let's just bring, let's just bring these FAP principles out to the general public in a much bigger way. So the vision of Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project is to alleviate the public health epidemics of loneliness and social isolation by offering scientifically supported solutions for anyone who wants richer, more meaningful relationships for self and others. And our mission is to just grow and nurture this worldwide network of open-hearted change seekers who strive to meet life's challenges through deepening interpersonal connection and rising to live more true to themselves. And this room is full of some of those open-hearted change seekers right now, Mavis. And I just wanna acknowledge that there are a lot of people in this room who are helping us realize this mission and vision. And I feel so much gratitude for that. Um, at Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project, we operate from a set of shared values, and those values affect all of the work that we and our leaders do. And so those values include things like communicating in a way that is authentic, um, honoring that inner wisdom of, of each person. I like to say this as we as individuals know what we need and what we desire. And we need to honor what we know in ourselves and in others. Cultural sensitivity and inclusivity, really trying to be uh, culturally competent while also being welcoming to people of various cultures, a social consciousness surrounding what's happening in our world right now and how that's impacting people, right? We just went through a massive pandemic. That was a global experience. We are all in some way bonded by that. And how does that impact us? Innovation and creativity, exploring something new and something different, right? It's therapeutic, but it's not necessarily therapy. And how can this be impactful and move us forward? And what ways can we get creative so that it's engaging for people? Um, that concept of open-hearted community. Um, when I talk about open-hearted community, I in my brain literally visualize like opening my rib cage to the world so that my heart is free and exposed um, and not locked in this cage that is made to protect it, but vulnerable and willing to connect and to be seen and to hear. Learning and growing, we are each becoming different people every time that we gain more information, every time that we are willing to learn a new less Gratitude, again, you've, you've seen us model this several times during 
um, this webinar and just how grateful we are for the folks who show up for this work and, and who do this work. Uh, integrity, uh, making sure that your actions are aligned with the words that are coming out of your mouth and respect, empathy, and kindness. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that kindness is absolutely one of my top values. And so I'm happy to be working for an organization where that is also a value that's shared. One of my favorite things that Mavis says about Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project is that the work that we do is as much about ourselves as it is about others. And so I'm gonna talk about what awareness and courage and love mean for self, and then Mavis will talk about others. When we talk about awareness, we're talking about that open-hearted presence where we're curious about our feelings, whether they're positive or negative, how tender we feel in that moment, what we're experiencing in our bodies when we feel a certain feeling and how our heart feels in those moments. And then understanding that the path that we've walked up to this point is going to influence how we react and how we interact with others. When we talk about courage, it's about creating possibility in the moment. How do we make these moments memorable? How do we envision our boldest, best, most authentic version of ourself and, and live true to that? And then in love, really taking that time to take in what is beautiful about ourselves and, and what we appreciate about ourselves. One of the I am statements that came up for me was I am lovable. And I think the fact that statement came up is a direct correlation to this work on self that I've been doing in the years that I've been here with ACL Global Project. And love is also about self-care. What are activities that soothe us, that calm our stress, that make us feel ready to take on the next day that recharge us, rejuvenate us and give us pleasure. And finally about being willing to let other people love you, to let them give you their love and not push that love away. Thank you, Danielle. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to work on yourself that you can't really connect authentically with others if you are not connected with yourself. But when you focus on others, you're aware of them with curiosity and tenderness. And you understand that there's a rich history which has shaped their reactions. You encourage them to be as bold as possible, to live true to their passions. You reflect their positive qualities. You recognize that they're doing their best validate their experience, and you communicate a very specific and personal appreciation rather than something generic, thank you, or thank you for sharing. Uh, Danielle, I'm looking at our time and we're running a bit behind. Mm -hmm. So let's just keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. So looking at the possibility of groups led by lay people all around the world and whether or not running these groups really works. In our 2002 participant feedback, we took nearly 300 people's feedback responses from that for the year. And we found that, yes, our participants do feel more connected after attending these meetings. It's over 80% of them that feel more connected than usual or a lot more connected than usual. And that's also reflected in the words that they share with us as well. So I'm not going to, I don't think we should take the time to read these, but mm -hmm. this is some of the participant feedback that we've gotten over the years. And after the webinar ends, we would love to hear from those of you who are in this meeting who've been to ACL 
meetups and hear a little bit from you as to what you've taken away from these meetings. And I love this one. ACL creates new possibilities for me in living. That's what we're here to do. I want to very briefly go over the latest research. So one thing that I really value about the Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project is that we are connected with my position at the University of Washington as a research scientist. And we're continually doing research to assess the effectiveness of our ACL interventions. So this is one that we did for couples during COVID-19. It was just a one session intervention where we brought, brought couples together to connect using an awareness, courage, and love protocol, just helping them make eye contact and say vulnerable things to each other and this is a scale that we use to assess their level of connection before and after. So what this graph shows is that their closeness was significantly higher than the control group, which the couples in the control group just watched a, watched a movie together. And on the marital quality scale, again, just a lot more connection than the control group. And this is a study assessing six sessions of ACL done by Emerson Hardebeck, who's now, he's now a doctoral person, a doctor. And he was our lead research coordinator. So he ran six sessions for his dissertation and people in the ACL group felt significantly closer to the people in their groups and they felt much more compassionate for themselves as well compared to the control group, which they were watching movies and talking about movies. So these control groups are actually important control groups and that we're comparing something that people might normally do to our intervention which fosters deep connection. Looking at the um, responses of people to our meetings and the research that we have done here at Marinus Courage and Love Global Project, we're really getting a picture that the solution for loneliness is creating these environments where social connections can thrive. And when we think about, again, the U.S. Surgeon General and these pillars that he talks about for advancing social connection, I know I really smiled when I read the report because if we look at these six different pillars, then our work actually does quite a few of them. So Mavis, thank you. Uh, so in terms of the way that um, he defines different things within it, we are strengthening infrastructure in local communities by training people to lead meetings. We are um, reforming a digital environment with our new community that you'll be hearing more about in just a minute. We are deepening the knowledge through our studies that we do, and we are building a culture of connection by creating this network of open-hearted change seekers who value vulnerability and authenticity and connection and who create these groups. And as I have briefly mentioned those things, um, I'm not gonna read through this slide, but it's work that we have already been doing. And it, it really brought a smile to my face to know that um, the work that we're doing is also aligned with these pillars that are designed um, through research and through um, a review of the situation in the U.S. 
and then created and, and posted by the US Surgeon General. We're just gonna wrap up by saying that fostering social connection requires that we each commit to investing in our relationships and our communities. And by being here, it just indicates to me that you're willing. Many of you, we already know that you're investing in your relationships and your communities already because you're a part of our project. And it requires that we commit to creating sustainable changes to our society. And that means addressing community infrastructure like parks, community centers, schools, digital connectivity, and promoting social and emotional learning, nurturing inclusive workspaces, implementing social policies, leveraging social media and technology in a positive way. So I think that we're all here to make our individual impact in the ways that we feel gifted in terms of creating sustainable changes to society. So we would just love for you to join us if you're not already a part of our community. We have a new, commu a new community that's launching on Mighty Networks, which brings everyone together in one space to just really connect with one another. And also inviting you, I lead or co-lead, I actually co-lead with a new leader every month, an international meeting, the first Sunday of the month where we just focus on a new topic of connection to ourselves and others. In addition to that, as I said, there are many of our network of leaders here and present, but if you are interested in leading um, awareness, courage, and love meetings, for the people who live in your local community. Uh, we would love to have you join our training. We have a new training in English coming up in September, and I'm happy to send more information along to folks. Uh, we'll be really sending that out this week. We, we just now posted on social media that we're starting up our new training. Um, and also, you can join us uh, by providing translation or interpretation services for us. Uh, just acknowledging today, Carlos and Fabiana are here providing interpretation services for us. And we are so, so grateful because that increases the people that we can reach and it increases the people that we can train to continue to grow this global community. Um, so if that's something that you are willing and able to do, we would love to have you come on and join us for that. So again, we wanna thank you. We wanna thank our translators today, Fabiana Ramos and Carlos Salinas, the researchers, whose research we cited, Emerson and Adam. I want to thank the University of Washington Center for Science of Social Connection, where I work in addition to ACL Global Project and the U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. If you'd like to know more, you can visit us at our website, livewithacl.org. Um, or you can scan this quick QR code with your phone. Um, and it will take you to a place where you can gain more information about the work that we do. The QR code, for those of you who are into QR codes, will actually take you to a way to sign up for our email list. And we will be emailing you with more information. Thank you all so, so much for being here. And we would love to take questions and also hear from you. If you've been a participant in our project and you'd like to say what it's been like for you, how it's impacted you. We're so grateful for all of you being here today. And just looking at faces that of people I'm really connected to and, and new faces I haven't seen before. So this is 
your chance to unmute yourselves and either make a comment or ask a question. Actually, before anyone speaks, I would love to introduce Michael Urednik, our executive director. He's been with us for a year. He replaced me as executive director and just freed me to do more of what I love to do. And just so grateful for you, Mike. Want to say a word to everybody here? Appreciate it. I know we're short on time, but thank you, Mavis and Daniil, for today's webinar and Fabiano and Carlos, Fabiana and Carlos for translation. Again, we can't do it without you. This month, as Mavis just said, is my one-year anniversary of being part of Awareness, Courage, and Love community. And I am grateful. I know that word's been used a lot at the end of this presentation, but to complete Mavis' sentence from our meditation, uh, I'm grateful to all of you who have been on this journey with us. Most of you have been on it longer than I have. I'm struck by Awareness, Courage, and Love's ability to take on a broad vital mission, uh, social exclusion and isolation, relatively tough, dark places, as well as authentic connections, and growing a community focused on improvements uh, to daily life, ourselves and others that was touched on, and investing in relationships in those communities. I thank you all. Thanks, Mike. So would love to hear from any of you who would like to speak, either if you have a question for us, or if you would just like to talk about what your experience has been like being part of our community. Hear me? Please. Uh, hi, I'm Ann. I was wondering after September, when will the next one be? The next training? The next training will be in the new year. Okay. So we'll be looking at 2024. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. They are eight week trainings, somewhat self paced. There are all kinds of modules that you study on your own. And then we have five experiential meetings as well. But so we run English, Spanish, and Portuguese trainings. And I'm not sure if the next one is going to be English again. If you can, it'd be great if you're an English speaker to join the one that's starting on September 10th and application deadline is September 3rd. I'll share. Suli. Yes. Hi, everyone. I was blessed to be part of the uh, monthly meetings for the last three um, months. And I must say that it, it increases your consciousness and increases awareness of your vision and mission. And the meditations are always uh, very powerful. And that's something that I've done for the past uh, 25 years. And I feel that the greater conscious awareness that we can bring opening the heart for ourselves so that we can serve our communities enhances dramatically the work that we are all part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you I so much. Really thank you so much, Silly. Thanks for speaking up. It takes courage to speak up in this setting. Henty. Hi, all. I'm so touched to be here and uh, I just want to express my gratitude and joy of being, I've been uh, a leader in ACL project for I think almost three years now in Finland and I feel like many areas of my life have been transformed by this work in, in multiple ways and I am just so touched and thankful for this. I had the privilege of seeing you, Penti, last week in Cyprus. So give us an example of one way your life has changed. Oh, in my uh, professional work, 
I have brought these principles, how I have been relating to my colleagues. And I notice we are starting to collaborate much more, also feeling much more open and um, uh, close to each other, uh, sharing about our difficulties in work, in our past lives and, and yeah, not needing to take a role, keep up a role in, in there, which brings so much relief. That's wonderful, Penti. Thank you. Anton, would you be willing to share something? Oh, I'm here and I'm happy. Hello, everyone. I don't know what will be happening today. <laughs> and I'm a little shaking. So because you, I you... didn't see you too long. <laughs> you haven't seen me for too long. Is that what you said? Yes. Anton, please tell us really briefly about how you've brought ACL to refugees. Oh, it's a very important question for me. I'm working with the refugees and forced migrants from the Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus in Tbilisi, in Georgia. I already said, told to me this, that everyone who come to us is have difficulties with the money, with the home, and they want technical help with the money, with the work, with the home, but abil ability to help is very small in our opportunities. But we try to show to people that the connection is the must Is the general thing to save our lives and nobody from us don't know now what waiting for us tomorrow but if we'll if we together we can stay with it mm. You always move me so much, Anton, with what you say. I'm so grateful to you for bringing your heart to this ACL work. Thank you. I'm not wanting to keep people longer than what we said, and we're already 20 minutes over time to kneel. What would you like to say to wrap up? And we we could stay longer to take questions, but I think we should let everyone go who was not expecting to spend more than 45 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. I feel honored to work with such a great group of humans around the world. It just, it brings me so much joy uh, and connection. And I've even heard myself say, I can't believe how close I feel to someone who I've never met in real life. I'm looking at several of your faces now while I say this, and I I know that you've said sent similar sentiments, you've, you've had similar feelings. And so yeah. I'm, I'm just so thankful that this work allows me to feel that feeling for people who are thousands of miles away from me. Yes, Daniil, it's been really incredible working on this webinar with you, and it's just incredible in general to work with you. We invite everyone here to join our project as 
a participant or a leader start as start being a participant first, see what we're about. Do you want me to post the QR code again? Did everyone get it? Okay, and I want to thank one of our board members who's here, Augustine Vilyas. Um, let's see if I can. May I have that QR code, please, again? You want it again? Okay. <laughs> Here's the QR code again. And we're so excited to be launching this new platform to bring all of us together. So you will find out how to, we'll be inviting you to join. But scan the QR code and we'll be sent to you the invitation. Does anyone else want to say anything before we close our meeting? Hey, thank you so much for being with us. And first Sunday in September, we're going to be offering our next international experiential meeting. So you'll hear from me about that if you're on our email list. Davis, can we do my favorite thing? You have so many favorite things. Which one is it? <laughs> one of my favorite things about this community is when everybody unmutes their microphone at the end and says goodbye to each other in whatever authentic feeling way that they are feeling it. So I would love for us to end this with everybody taking a moment to unmute their mics and say their farewells until next time. And your yeah. native language. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.